Hey, this is Jen, and you really do love science. You just don't know it yet. And about this time of year, your teacher is going to be asking you to do some problems about free fall and projectile motion. And free fall and projectile motion are both about things falling through the air. So far, you should be comfortable with the equations that I've written down so far, which are velocity equals distance over time, or velocity is change in position over change in time and velocity is in meters per second, and acceleration, you should know by now, is change in velocity over change in time, and that's measured in meters per second squared. In these problems, you're not allowed to use like kilometers or miles, and you're not allowed to use minutes or hours. You have to convert your distance to meters, always, and you have to convert your time into seconds, and then you're going to be plugging them in. Now remember that acceleration is a rate of a rate. Velocity is a rate, how fast something's going, and acceleration is all about how quickly the velocity is changing. So that's why it's a rate of a rate. So it's how much the velocity changes every second, and you get that by dividing the change in velocity over the change in time, and then you'll get meters per second per second which is meters per second squared. Now so far you've probably done problems like in the last chapter where you had a car and it was slamming on the brakes and it was decelerating and coming to rest or something like that and so you had to figure out the, the acceleration or the deceleration of the car or maybe there was a train and the train was speeding up and you calculated the acceleration using these equations. But with this chapter with free fall and projectile motion you're actually going to be having the acceleration be because of gravity. Because gravity is pulling on the object and making it fall faster and faster toward the Earth. So in this chapter, we're going to use a special kind of acceleration, and it's called acceleration due to gravity. And we have a special abbreviation for it, and that's small g. And a lot of students, like, they get, like, real short cutty, <laughs> and they're like, oh, I know, little g, yeah, that's gravity. But no, I want you to be very precise, no, very accurate, and I want you to call g acceleration due to gravity. It's not gravity, because gravity itself is a force, right? And forces are measured in newtons. And so if you're talking about gravity, you're talking about a force in newtons. But if you're talking about little g, uh, which we're about to talk about, that is actually the acceleration due to gravity, which is in meters per second squared. So on Earth, we know the value for g. Little g is 9.8, or some teachers say 9.81 meters per second squared. And that's a constant on Earth. I mean, technically speaking, if you went up to the top of a really high mountain like Mount Everest, you're farther away from the center of the Earth, and so the acceleration due to gravity is just a little bit lower. But, you know, don't argue about stuff like that with your teacher. Just accept that on Earth we're taking 9.81 is pretty much the average acceleration due to gravity. Now, on the moon, you might have some problems later where it's like it, when you get to your gravitation chapter and you do more complicated gravity problems with planetary motion and stuff like that, then you're going to learn that the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is like 1.6 meters per second squared. And so on the moon, you'll have a different little g. But right now, we're just doing problems on Earth. So whenever you have acceleration in one of these problems, you know how you plug in numbers where there's a variable? Well, during these free fall problems, wherever you see an A for acceleration, you're just going to be plugging in G or 9.81 meters per second squared. So it's going to be kind of easy whenever you see an A, as long as it's vertical acceleration due to free fall. Okay, let's talk a little bit for a second about positives and negatives. Your teacher might have already told you that we're going to use negative 9.81 meters per second squared, or negative 9.8. And by the way, if your teacher says we're going to use 9.8 and she rounds it to two significant figures, don't like argue with her and be like, oh, I looked it up on the internet and it's 9.81 or something like that. Because just do whatever your teacher's doing because you actually want your answers on your quizzes and your answers on your test to exactly match hers so that she's not thinking that, you know, oh, his answer's not quite right. What did he do wrong? You know, just use whichever number she chooses or he chooses and then you'll be good to go and get the exact same answer that's on her answer key. All right, so negative. Let's talk about why it's negative. 
Well, one reason, or the reason I should say, that it's negative is because gravity is pulling down. And we decided in physics that we were going to, it's like a convention and it's arbitrary or whatever, but we decided that down is negative and up is positive, and we decided that left is negative and right is positive. And remember that in physics, Negative doesn't really mean less than zero. Like a, a negative velocity doesn't mean you're, you're going less than sitting still. A negative velocity or a negative acceleration just means in the opposite direction as a positive velocity or a positive acceleration. So negative simply means in the opposite direction. The tricky things about these problems, it's the, the book and your teacher, they're not going to tell you to make certain things negative. You just have to be on the lookout for yourself to make things negative. Let me show you an example. So let's say there's a building and somebody's throwing something off the edge of a building like this. And that would be projectile motion. Okay, if it's falling down, the distance is going to be negative. Now, they're not going to say, oh, by the way, make your distance negative. No, and they're not going to say the object falls a distance of negative 100 meters. No, they're going to phrase it like this to try to trick you. They're going to say the building is 100 meters high or 100 meters tall. Or they'll say the height of the building is 100 meters. That's the given information. And then they're going to watch and see if you know that because the object's falling down, that you know to say, oh, it's down, so I'm going to make it negative 100 meters. And when you plug the distance into your equations, you're going to remember to make both the distance negative and also acceleration due to gravity negative because gravity's pulling down. So far, so good? OK, so when you have things falling, because gravity in general is pulling constantly and it's not like changing, you know, in past problems, if you were driving a car, you could accelerate for like five minutes and then you could decelerate if there's a red light and then you could be stopped. So when you're driving a car, your acceleration is not constant and it's not uniform, which means constant. But with these free fall problems, the good thing is the acceleration in these problems is constant or uniform and Whenever you have uniform, which means constant, like when you wear a uniform to school, it means you're constantly wearing the same outfit and you get t tired of it, but uniform or constant acceleration, that's when you get to use these certain equations that I'm about to give you. Now they're long, but there are only three of them that you really need to know, and you're probably going to memorize them pretty quickly because you'll do like you know, 20 different problems, and after you do like five or six, you'll be like, okay, I've got these memorized. So the first one is, oh, first I want to define our variables. Hmm, let me do that in the bottom right corner of the screen, just so you know what we're talking about. Okay, a first variable I want you to know is VF, and that's going to, no, let's do VI first. VI, that's going to be your initial velocity. Think about it. If something's accelerating or decelerating, its initial velocity is going to be different than its final velocity because it's speeding up or slowing down. And I'm just going to give you the units here in the parentheses. Vf is the final velocity, also in meters per second. Some books for initial velocity, some books are just going to use Vo. And what that means is the velocity at time zero meaning like before we started the stopwatch and the time was zero, that's your initial velocity or V sub O. So V sub O and initial velocity are exactly the same thing. It just depends on what your book uses. And then if your book uses V sub O for initial velocity, it probably just uses plain old V for final velocity. So I'm sorry that, um, you know, some books are different, but for me, I'm going to use initial and final VI and VF. And if you can just follow along and think about your book, if it's VO and V, then, you know, try to translate it in your own mind, okay? So we've got those. Now, some books use delta X for change in position, but I like to use D for distance, if that's okay with you. And a lot of books use D. So we're going to say distance. Remember, it has to be in meters. It cannot be in miles or kilometers or something like that, okay? 
So we also have acceleration. And acceleration is going to be, um, in these problems, mostly negative because it's going to be pulling down. It's going to be gravity pulling down on things as they fall. That will be in meters per second squared. And we'll be plugging in, normally plugging in nine point, negative 9.81 meters per second squared. And then, oh yeah, there's time. And the time is like the time for the fall and the units will be seconds. So what your teacher is going to do is going to, she or he is going to give you like two or three of these bits of information like, oh, the rock fell off the building and the building was 100 meters tall and, you know, how long did it take for the rock to land? And so she'll give you one or two givens and then you'll be figuring out one or two unknowns and you're going to use the equations that I'm about to give you at the top of the paper. So for uniform acceleration, meaning constant acceleration, which we can do in this chapter, we're going to use these equations, and they're really easy and fun, actually, once you get used to them. Oops, I just did a superscript instead of a subscript. Okay, the first one is that final velocity is equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Pretty simple, right? You're just going to plug in some numbers. Second equation is that final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus 2 times acceleration times distance. And the third equation is that distance equals initial velocity times time plus 1 half a t squared. These are your three equations that you're going to be using for uniform or constant acceleration during free, free fall. Now, check this out. Do you notice that all three equations have acceleration in them? There they are, a, a, and a, right? So these three equations are obviously used, again, when we have acceleration going on. I'll give that a smiley face. I'm about to turn the page, so just take a look at this whole page and see if you like everything and see if it all makes sense. You know, you got the 9.81 probably memorized already. Make sure that you make it. Let's put a negative next to it because it's going to be down. So I'm going to put a negative right here next to that 9.81 since acceleration due to gravity is negative and it's pulling down. Okay, so you've got this good whole page. Okay, so I'm ready to go to the next page. So here's what's going to happen in these problems. We are going to have examples where something is falling not only down, but also out, like this. Or maybe a football being kicked, you know, up and over. So in these projectile motion problems, the motion is going to be horizontal and vertical both. It's going to be going up and over, or down and over. Yeah, it could be down and over also. So notice back here on these equations, notice all of the acceleration, acceleration, acceleration in these red, pinkish red, magenta equations that we just wrote down. Okay, well, horizontally, what's the acceleration? Like, there's no gravity horizontally. There's no gravity pulling something forward or backward. So, I mean, how can we use those equations for horizontal motion? Well, the answer is we can't. Now, later when you get into college physics, they're going to talk about air resistance. And maybe in some of your like AP physics classes or some of the teachers that are teaching in, in difficult physics classes, they'll start getting into air resistance, which is actually going to cause some deceleration horizontally. And she or he might give you like a bit of air resistance, uh, like a number to, to stick into the calculation. And so there will be some kind of a change in velocity horizontally due to air resistance. But for the most part, if they don't mention anything about air resistance, you're just going to assume that the air resistance is not being taken into consideration and that horizontally there's nothing slowing the ball down or there's nothing slowing the object down. So horizontally, the velocity is constant. It's not slowing down and it's not speeding up because there isn't any force pulling it or pushing it horizontally. Once it leaves, like the kicker's foot, it just goes with constant velocity. When you neglect air resistance, once again, I just have to be very particular about that. 
Okay, so if the velocity is constant and we have no acceleration, then horizontally all we need to use is velocity equals distance over time. This simple, simple equation that you memorized already in like the previous chapter. This is the only horizontal equation you need in these projectile motion problems because of the lack of acceleration horizontally. And so the key to these problems and the key to doing them perfectly is this. Even though the object is flying through the air both horizontally and vertically at the same time, it's actually up to you mathematically to separate the horizontal motion from the vertical motion and do the calculations horizontally and vertically, do those calculations separately. I'm going to show you how to do that. The best way to separate the horizontal values and the vertical values is to create a table and actually draw a line showing, hey, I'm separating the horizontal and the vertical information. So, all right, now that I'm making a table, I'm going to have to give you a real problem. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe kick a football and ask how high it goes or something like that. So let's pretend with this green football that's up at the top, um, let's say that I want to um, calculate here the height and we'll say what's the height or how high does the football go. So what we're wondering about is the vertical height or the vertical distance and that's going to be our unknown that we're searching for. So let's say that your teacher gives you an initial velocity, an initial velocity that's at an angle. Like watch this. So let's say the football is initially kicked at like, I don't know, 23.0 meters per second. By the way, I have no idea how fast a football gets kicked, but we're just making up numbers. So 23.0 meters per second is the way it's kicked. Oh, and she has to give you like the angle. Let's say it's kicked at an angle of 31 degrees from the horizontal or from the ground. So that's your given information. Now notice that the 23.0 meters per second is that initial velocity. The problem is that you can't use the 23.0 meters per second in any equations. I'm going to write our horizontal equations over here. Horizontally we have velocity equals distance over time and for our vertical equations, we have the final velocity equals the initial velocity plus acceleration times time. The final velocity squared equals the initial velocity squared plus 2AD. And the distance equals the initial velocity times the time plus 1 half AT squared. So these three are your vertical equations right here. And the more you write them, the better you'll get at just memorizing those and being able to write them really quickly. All right, so there's our simple little, I love to put a box around that simple little horizontal equation. So we're about to plug numbers into these equations, like initial velocity is something we want to plug into these equations. But check out that initial velocity that your teacher gave you, 23.0 meters per second at an angle of 31 degrees from the horizontal. Okay, look at it. Is it horizontal or is it vertical? Hmm, it's neither one or you could say it's both because the football is being kicked. What color can I use now? The football is being kicked over in the forward direction and up. So this 23.0 meters per second has a horizontal component, so we're going to call that V sub H, the horizontal velocity. And this is like the horizontal initial velocity, <laughs> VHI. And then we have the vertical velocity. This 23.0 has a vertical component, and you've studied the components of vectors, right? How to break it down into the X and Y components. So here we have an initial vertical velocity. The reason you have to separate the initial vertical velocity from the initial horizontal velocity is because in the calculations you've got to keep them separate. If you're plugging horizontal information into an equation like this equation right here, you have to keep all of that information horizontal. This is going to be a horizontal velocity, a horizontal distance, and a horizontal time. Vertically, when you use the vertical equations, 
every single thing you plug into those equations, the final velocity, the initial velocity, the acceleration, and the time, and the distance, every single one of those values has to be vertical information. You're not allowed to mix in these projectile motion problems. The key is that you're not allowed to mix the horizontal and the vertical information in the same equation. That's why we did this table to the left to clearly, clearly separate our horizontal and our vertical information. So what we've got to do is we've got to find the components of this initial velocity because horizontally we need a velocity and vertically we need an initial velocity. And the final velocity might not be involved in this problem. We'll see. We don't know if we need to solve for final velocity, but Whoa, guess what? In this problem, have I told you yet to look for hidden zeros? Let's talk right now for a second about hidden zeros. What I mean by hidden zeros, in a word problem, there are going to be some values that are zero, but they're not going to come out and say to you, oh, the final velocity in this problem is zero. No, they're just going to tell you that the football's kicked, and it goes in an arch, and it goes up, and then it goes down. And it's up to you to know that when something is kicked up and then down, vertically speaking, if we just talk about the vertical motion, remember we have to separate the horizontal and the vertical. So let's think only about the vertical pathway. The football's going up and then it's coming back down, right? So the vertical motion by itself is two pathways. Here we have up and down. So if we take the vertical motion by itself, we have an initial velocity here as the football's kicked, and then we have a final velocity up here at the top. Now what happens instantaneously, just for a split second at the top, when the football's right up here, and it's about to turn around and come back down and fall again? What happens to that velocity? Well, just for a split second at the very top, the velocity at the top is zero meters per second, and that's just a split second as it turns around. Now think about what your teacher is asking for. When she says calculate the height, meaning how high the football is going, would you agree that really what you're calculating is the distance that the football travels vertically on its way up? not on its way up and down, which would be twice the height, but just on its way up. And so if you're just calculating the distance or the height on the way up, then everything that you're going to plug into these equations is actually going to be one-way information, meaning either up or down, but not both, because the height is just going to be the distance it goes either on its way up or in some cases on its way down like look at this building if something's falling off the building then the height of the building is going to be the distance as it's on its way down but these vertical equations are used for one-way calculations the distance traveled either on the way up or on the way down now look down at the bottom of the page again if you're talking about the football as it's on its way up like this Okay, on its way up, would you agree that the initial velocity is down here as it gets kicked and the final velocity is up here as it stops for a second? So the final velocity would be zero if you're talking about the way up. But in this football problem, the cool thing is that the way down is symmetrical and it's really going to be the same exact information on the way down. So you could actually do the same calculation on the way down if you wanted to. If you chose to do that, then look, it's the initial velocity that's going to be zero on its way down because at the very tippy top, that's where it stops for a split second. So on its way down, it's the initial velocity that's zero, and it's the final velocity that's going to be some number that we calculate from the triangle with 31 degrees. You'll get more practice with this later when things are being thrown up and then thrown down. We'll try to do one more problem like that. But just get used to the fact that at the tippy top, there's a hidden zero. That hidden zero is that the velocity for a split second is zero, and the problem is definitely not going to tell you that. You have to look for those hidden zeros. There's a couple other ways to look for hidden zeros, but like when it says, oh, this object is falling from rest, or it's dropped from rest, 
When it uses those words from rest, it means the initial velocity vertically is zero. So that's another hidden zero. Okay, back to the problem. So I'm over here at my horizontal vertical table on the left. And what I want to do right now is fill in a hidden zero. I'm going to choose to do the way up just because that's where the triangle is drawn. It looks like the football's headed on its way up. So if I'm choosing on the way up, my final velocity is the hidden zero because at the tippy top, it stops vertically for a split second. Now it keeps going horizontally, but vertically at the tippy top, it's no longer rising. Okay, I'm filling in some information. I'm starting to feel a little bit good about this problem. Let's see if I know anything else. I don't know the height. Hmm, do I know the time? I don't know the time. I don't know the horizontal distance. I don't know. Great, I've got a lot of stuff I don't know. I'm starting to feel scared. What about, um, let's see, the acceleration. Horizontally, the acceleration is zero, so we don't even need to list that on the horizontal side. Oh, I know horizontal on the vertical side. I mean, <laughs> I know acceleration on the vertical side. Acceleration on the vertical side is g, negative 9.80 meters per second squared. Yay! Okay, we got a little bit of information here. Now let's see if we can get our horizontal velocity and our vertical initial velocity from the triangle that's sort of in orange. And I'm going to draw it again in orange right in the middle of the page. Okay, so we have a hypotenuse which was given to us of this 23.0 meters per second, which is how fast the football was kicked. And you football players are going to have to send me like a notification on my Google Plus page or something and tell me if that's a ridiculous number. So we have a an angle here with the horizontal with the ground of 31 degrees. And we've got our horizontal velocity and we've got our vertical velocity. And these are the X and Y components of this 23.0 uh, resultant, which is the hypotenuse. So I think we can use sine, cosine, and tangent and figure out the initial horizontal velocity and the initial vertical velocity. And once again, in order to solve these problems and plug numbers into the equation, you must, must, must separate the horizontal and the vertical. Never mix them. Never use them together. That's why we can't use the 23.0 because it's like a mixture of horizontal and vertical. So now what I'm doing is I'm saying that sine of 31, I'm not going to write it down because I'm kind of squeezed for space, but sine of 31 is going to be opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of 31 is going to be the vertical velocity divided by 23. So if I take 23 times the sine of 31, I'm going to get my vertical initial velocity. So the vertical initial velocity turns out to be 11.8 meters per second, and that's going to be you know up, which is a positive direction. Horizontally, let's see if we can figure that out initially. Again, this comes from the 23.0. This time we're going to do cosine of 31 because the horizontal side is adjacent. So cosine of 31 equals adjacent, which is the VH, over hypotenuse, which is the 23. So I'll take 23 times cosine of 31, and we're getting 19.7. So the initial uh, horizontal velocity is 19.7 meters per second. That's going to be to the right the way we drew it. So fortunately, both of these velocities are positive because we've got one going up and one going to the right. Once you break down that initial 23 velocity into the horizontal and the vertical components, guess what? <laughs> You're done with it. You are done with that 23 once you get the horizontal and the vertical components out of it. And you, you kind of want to cross it off because you want to make sure you never plug it in anywhere. It's not horizontal. It's not vertical. It's not useful. But we did get some useful information, which I'm now going to plug into the table. The vertical initial velocity we found to be 11.8 meters per second. The horizontal initial velocity we found to be 19.7 meters per second. I don't have room for the units, but I think you're good with that. Okay, now that we know our horizontal initial velocity and our vertical initial velocity, and we know our um, acceleration vertically, and we know our final velocity, I think we might have enough information to solve for something. So what we need here is the height. That's what she asked for. This imaginary teacher, whoever she is, let's call her, um, I don't know, 
Mrs. Snodgrass. So Mrs. Snodgrass is asking you for the height of the football. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say we need the distance. We're going to look at our three equations on the right, and we're going to say which equation can we use to find the distance, and which equation actually can we plug in numbers? Do we have enough numbers to fill in? So let me grab this orange color again. Look at the first equation. Do we know the final velocity? No. Do we know the, and these are vertical equations again. Do we know the initial velocity? Yes. Do we know the acceleration vertically? Yes. Do we know the time vertically? No. We don't know the time, and we don't know the final velocity vertically. Oh, yes, we do. Excusez-moi. We do know the final velocity vertically. On the way up, the final velocity vertically is zero. That was that hidden zero. And so we could solve for time if we needed to. And you know what? We probably will need to in a minute. But let's just see if we can get to the distance without finding time. Let's look at the second equation. The final velocity we do know, which is zero. The initial velocity we do know, check mark. The acceleration we do know, negative 9.81 and the distance is what we need. So ding, 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 this equation is great because all we have is one unknown, that's the distance, and that's actually what we need to solve for. So we don't even need to find time in this equation. Usually you do need to find time, but in this problem, we can just go ahead and do vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ad. And do you start to see the benefit of memorizing these three equations? Because you're going you're gonna to be picking from these three equations basically for every problem. So I'm going to plug in the final velocity. Remember, it's one way. We're just going to use on the way up. So on the way up, the final velocity is 0. And let's square it, shall we? Ha <laughs> ha. The initial velocity. Remember, we have to use the vertical initial velocity. So we're going to use that 11.8. Don't forget to square it. And then we're going to plug in 2, negative 9.81. And then d is what we're looking for. So look, we have an equation, and there's only one unknown. So we are well on our way to solving this problem. So I'm going to do 11.8, and I'm going to square it. And then I'm going to move it. Like, it's 139.24. But I'm going to move it to the other side of the equation over here. So really what I'm going to end up with is I'm going to subtract it from both sides. Negative 139.24 equals 2 times 9 point, negative 9.81. So 9.81 times 2. So you'll get 19, negative 19.62d. Now it's really easy to solve. We'll just divide both sides by negative 19.62. So 139.24, negative 139.24, divided by negative 19.62, and you get your D. So your D in this problem, whoops, I'm writing on top of the logo, the D is 7.09. How many significant figures did she give you? I'm going to go with the three significant digits that are on that velocity, the 23.0, which is the given information, and I'm going to say 7. Point, it's 7.0968, so I'm going to say 7.10 meters is going to be the vertical distance. Remember, we just solved for the vertical distance or how high the football went. And I hope you see the logic. The reason why we chose just to do a one-way trip, because obviously the height at the top was half of its trip or just on the way up for it to reach that height. We just found the vertical distance, and it is a positive number because we chose the way up. Had we chosen the way down, then the distance would end up being negative. How would it end up being negative? You'd be like, well, how could it still be negative? How could the distance end up negative when the acceleration is also negative? You know, that, you know, it's still, the distance would still end up positive. But no, if you ended up doing this problem on the way down, turns out that the final velocity that you would be plugging in would also be a velocity on its way down. So that final velocity would be negative, And then you end up with a 0 for the initial velocity. And so your distance on the way down actually does end up being a negative number. Now what if your teacher said, 
how long is it in the air um, or how long does it take to get to the top let's say that first how long does it take to get to the tippy top at that height of 7.10 meters well then you actually have to choose a different equation and you could choose the first equation or you could choose the last equation do you see how on the third equation you've got vit plus one half at squared because there's a t and a t squared and they're both unknown if we use that third equation we'd end up having to use the quadratic formula to solve for t so i think it would be much simpler for us to choose that top equation which is vf equals vi plus at and we could figure out the time it takes to get up to that height of 7.10 meters so if you don't mind i'm just going to erase over here this little hidden zeros thing so that we can make a little more room without turning the page what we're going to do now is that use that first equation to figure out the time it took to get up to that height so we know and we're down here by the way if you can't see so we know that the final velocity on the way up is zero we know that the initial velocity now are we plugging in horizontal values right now or vertical values think about it are, when we say final velocity is zero at the top are we doing horizontal or vertical oh we're doing vertical right now and this is a vertical equation so we're going to plug in again that vertical initial velocity and since it was on its way up it's going to be a positive 11.8 meters per second and even though it's on its way up which direction is gravity pulling think about it it's on its way up but is gravity is the earth pulling on the object in the upward direction to accelerate it faster and faster upward or is acceleration due to gravity pulling it back down to the earth so even though the object the football is traveling up the acceleration due to gravity is still negative because the earth is pulling it back down so be careful with that but t is what she asked for miss snodgrass asked for the t in this problem to say how long did it take to get to the tippy top all right all we have to do now is the algebra we just have to plug some things in good the time it takes to get to the top is 1.20 seconds so we just answered another question that your teacher might ask you is how long did it take to get to the top now here's a third question that they might ask you they might say what's the hang time and you'll be like what what does that mean the hang time well the hang time is a special term I'm writing at the very top now trying to fill up this whole page the hang time is the total time in the air now the total time in the air in this problem notice that it is on the way up and on the way down that it's in the air so what we just found right here is the time just down at the bottom left just on its way up is 1.20 seconds so does it make sense to you that in this problem it's not going to be this way in every problem but in this problem because the football is going up and then down that the hang time is going to be twice the vertical time and that's often going to be the case if something's going up and then down so right here at the top I'm going to say the hang time is equal to equal to two times the vertical time like on the way up so it's going to be two times 1.20 seconds so the hang time is going to be 2.40 seconds all right that is the total time in the air you're learning a lot on one page as I can see so 2.40 is the total time it's in the air okay now your teacher could ask you a final question what if your teacher asked you for the distance down the field meaning how far did the football go down the field well horizontally what equation can we use remember that your three long equations those were all vertical equations and vertical information only please keep it pure keep it vertical okay no horizontal information can go into those three long equations but luckily thank goodness we have our simple horizontal equation right here so we're going to use this horizontal equation that is very simple of v equals d over t 
Do we know the horizontal velocity? Do you mind if I go to the top left corner? Gosh, if somebody, like if your parents walked in right now and saw this page, they'd be like, wait, where is she even teaching right now? But you're going to be like, mom, she's in the top left corner, duh. So I'm going to the top left corner and I'm using like maybe a dark green. And so what I'm going to say is V equals D over T. And so do we know our horizontal velocity? Remember right now we're dealing with a horizontal equation. Let's look at our chart. Ooh, we do know a horizontal initial velocity. And actually since the horizontal velocity is constant, um, and I want to write that here, the horizontal velocity is constant. It doesn't change. That's why we just wrote one velocity on the horizontal side. It's not like there's an initial horizontal velocity and a final horizontal velocity. No, the horizontal velocity is not changing because there's no acceleration. So we just write one velocity on the horizontal side. And that velocity we figured out from that sine cosine tangent triangle, and we figured it out to be 19.7 meters per second horizontally. All right, the distance horizontally. Well, that's what she's asking for now. So we don't know the distance, but we figured out the horizontal time. Think about it. Is the horizontal time, look at that horizontal distance. It's all the way down the field. Should we use, to get this distance, which is all the way down the field, should we use the time for the trip just on its way up? Or should we use the time for the entire time in the air, which is called the hang time, like the 2.40 seconds for it to be the football to go the whole way. I say we use the hang time for this horizontal distance because we're looking at the picture and we're saying, okay, the football went the whole way down the field up and down. So I'm going to plug in here 2.40 seconds and you have to think about which time you're going to use. So now we have an equation with everything plugged in and only one unknown, which is awesome. 19.7, I'm going to do times 2.4. 47.28, is that a good kick? 47 meters, I think it's a really good kick. Um, so the distance that the football goes down the field is 47.28 meters. And again, that is a horizontal distance down the field. Now, if you want to, you can fill in the rest of your little table like Oh, the distance is 47.28 meters, and vertically the time was 1.20 seconds, just because it feels good to kind of complete your table. And horizontally, the time was 2.40 seconds. And I like to write SEC so it doesn't look like 2.405, you know. That S can really look like a 5. So please, 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 when you write seconds, please write SEC so your teacher doesn't think it's a 5. So I think I filled in everything except our vertical distance, which we calculated as 7.10 meters. So I'm just going to erase that question mark since now we have everything. And I'm going to now write down for that vertical distance positive 7.10 meters. That's how high it went. And our entire chart is filled in. So even though it looks like a big, huge mess, I am sure on your test paper you can separate these things and do them in order and circle your answers and make it really easy for your teacher to figure out what you did, follow your logic, see where you plugged in your numbers. I think she'll, she'll like the fact that you, may, you separated your horizontal and your vertical information by making this table. And then just make sure you use your units Make sure you're nice and neat and do the drawing in the beginning to label everything. It really helps you picture what's happening, especially when you're talking about one way time versus hang time, which is the whole way. So I hope you understood this problem. The next problem that I'm giving you is actually an airplane problem and the first half of it got cut off. Like I was recording this morning and for some reason the first half of the video got completely cut off. And so the next problem that you're about to see is actually you're going to come in in the middle of the problem. It's an airplane dropping a package um, for some Peace Corps workers. And the Peace Corps workers are standing near a river and they're standing under the airplane when the airplane drops the package and you're calculating how far from the uh, Peace Corps workers that the package lands. And so you're about to watch that problem but you're going to come in in the middle of it, but I think you'll understand, and you can pause the video and read everything that's on the screen. I think you'll understand what's going on, 
and um, and you can see another problem being solved. So keep in mind a few little tips. Remember, downward distances are negative. Downward velocities are negative. Downward acceleration due to gravity is negative. If somebody gave you a velocity, initially somebody was throwing something downward, that initial velocity would be negative because it's being thrown downward. Look for hidden zeros. If something's dropped from rest, then that initial vertical velocity is zero. Um, look for other hidden zeros, uh, like if something is thrown up in the air and at the tippy top it stops before it comes back down, then at the tippy top that final velocity is zero. So search for your hidden zeros, make sure you use correct units, and I don't know what else to tell you except I hope that you actually memorize your equations and become really, really good at these problems. Practice them, my heavens. You can't do these problems very well without lots of practice. So please do like 10, at least like 10 of these and get really, really good at them, okay? And now you know how to do projectile motion problems and free fall problems. Okay, get an A.